Hey peeps, in this video I want to talk about the differences between clippers versus limiters and GM Audio Clipper versus other clippers on the market. This is in relation to an article I posted on my website and if you want to check that out there's a link in the description. So let's get stuck in and if you've got any questions just throw them in the comments. <laughs> Now the reason why they sound different is that one is a precise wave shaper. So basically the signal comes in and it is being reshaped instantaneously and then we hear the result. Whereas a limiter takes the signal input, turns it into an envelope, applies some sort of smoothing to that envelope and then uses that to control the volume of the incoming signal. And this is how all compressors and limiters work. Now modern mastering limiters can often be a lot more complex but this is what Live's limiter is doing, so that's what we're comparing it to. So what this means in practical terms is that they affect the sound very differently. Here I've got a picture of a kick drum. So this faint line underneath here, that's the original waveform of the kick. These darker waveforms on top are the process signals. And then this vertical line here I've marked as the position of the original peak of the original sound. So you can see that with the clipped version, that the signal very closely matches the original waveform until it reaches the ceiling or threshold, and then it is clipped. And then when it returns back to below the ceiling, it still retains the shape of the original signal. Whereas if we look at the limited version, even before the peak is reached, it's reshaping the signal, it's turned it down. And then even below the ceiling, the waveform has been changed and all the changes that it applies are a lot smoother. So the clipper is gonna add a bit more edge to the sound, but it's gonna reshape the sound less than a limiter, as the limiter uses smoothing on the envelope that it uses to control the volume to reduce the distortion. But in reducing that distortion, it actually changes more of the resulting waveform. Now this diagram shows the difference between the two. So I've basically taken the original signal and inverted the phase and applied it to the process signal so that we're only left with the difference between the unprocessed and processed signal. So you can see this is where the clipper has changed the signal for a very, very short duration, less than 10 milliseconds. So this is gonna be pretty much inaudible. Whereas the limiter, because of the slow release used to reduce distortion, is gonna affect a lot more of the sound. So which one is more transparent? Well, if used correctly, the clipper is gonna affect less of the sound therefore gonna be far less audible. Now this doesn't mean that clipping is better than limiting in all scenarios. There might be particular times that you want the sound to be softer, and that would be a perfect opportunity to use Live's limiter. But if you're trying to reduce dynamic range transparently and get louder mixes, then using clipping is going to be of huge benefit to you. So here I've got a live set set up to recreate the results that I mentioned in the articles. So to recreate these results for yourself, you'll need to use operator. I've set the oscillator to fixed, multi set to 10, and the frequency set to 222. So that the final frequency is 2220 hertz. And I've set the output volume to minus 4.5 dB. And then inside the clip, I've got just one note, C3, for about 32 bars. So that will basically play a sine wave that will look like this in span. So we've just got that single frequency, and then this stuff down here is noise from operator. Generally, we don't hear this, and it is very low level, so it's below 132 decibels. Now the settings that I've got for span, I've got the Average time set to 400 milliseconds. I've got it set to show the maximum, so the peak. And the range for the low is set to minus 160 decibels, and the range for the high is zero decibels. And I've got the block size set to 4096. So this gives us a really accurate reading of what's going on in terms of spectral content, so frequency content in the signal. Now, if I turn on this audio effect rack, these are all set to clip at minus six dB. So we're getting roughly the same amount of clipping for each device. And I've got GM Audio Clipper 1.2, Clipper 2.1, and K-Clip 0. So 
I'll turn this on and with Clipper 1.2 soloed and just kind of focusing in to the higher frequencies here, we can see this is our original sine wave and then these are the harmonics, these ones here. And then this top one, it looks like it is a harmonic, but if I turn this on, we can actually see that it will, it's moving in the opposite direction when it reaches a certain point. See how it folds back in? So that's the aliasing taking place. So aliasing is when we try and create or store a signal that is beyond the Nyquist frequency and the Nyquist frequency is half of our sample rate. So I'm running at 48 kilohertz as I generally do. So our Nyquist is 24 kilohertz. So if we try and create or store a signal that is higher in frequency than that, it will be folded back into the original signal. And that's what aliasing is. So our very first alias peak is at around minus 34 dB with Clipper 1.2. Now this uses eight times oversampling. So it has very good aliasing rejection, but because of the filter being quite slow, it doesn't do much to attenuate this first alias. Whereas if we compare this to Clipper 2.1, this first alias is at about minus 54 dB. And we can see that the aliasing after that is a little bit higher in level, but it's still below minus 96 decibels, which was my goal. 16-bit audio is between zero and minus 96 decibels. So if we rendered this out to a 16-bit audio file with dither, then we wouldn't have any of this aliasing in the resulting file because it is below the 16-bit level. And now if we move to Kclip zero, this only uses two times oversampling and we can see that the result is much worse. We have a lot of aliasing that is above minus 96 decibels and the first alias is at about minus 36. So this only uses two times oversampling. GM Audio Clipper 2.1 uses five times oversampling and Clipper 1.2 uses eight times. But even though this is only using five times oversampling, it still has better aliasing rejection than Clipper 1.2, thanks to the design of the filter. Now Kclip Zero, it only uses two times oversampling. So admittedly, it's not going to do as well as the other two examples that we have here. But this brings up a point that I thought was interesting in that Kclip Zero only has two times oversampling when you're listening back in real time, but then when you export a track, it will oversample it 16 times. So the aliasing will be a lot less when you export the file. Now that's good, but the problem with that is that you're gonna be making mixed decisions based on what you're hearing. And you're making changes to the sound based on, you know, that aliasing being present, then when you go to export the file, those changes will be redundant. So it isn't very good for making reliable decisions when you're mixing. That's why GM Audio Clipper is five times oversampling all the time. And with the polyphase oversampling, means it's lower latency and more CPU efficient than most other oversampling algorithms. Now let's have a look at the filtering. So I've got another audio effect rack and I'm using this great plugin by Bertom Audio called EQ Curve Analyzer. And how you use this is basically you have one instance before the device or plugin and another instance afterwards. So the first one is a signal generator and the second one gives us this plot here. Now to show the phase properly, we need to set the latency correctly. So if I hover my cursor over the device title, then down here in the status bar, it will tell me the latency in samples. So it's five samples, so I've set latency to five, and this is the correct uh, phase plot here. So there is phase shift from the filtering present in this device, even when no clipping is occurring. And this top filter is from the oversampling algorithm and this filter at the low end was a decision when I was developing the plugin uh, to remove DC offset. Now people really enjoyed the sound of this device but it isn't the most transparent that it could be. And because it's using uh, IIR filters, so infinite impulse response, basically filters that use feedback, means that it does have phase shift, which is this purple line. Whereas if we compare that to these other plugins or devices, so GM Audio Clipper 2.1,
I've got the latency set correctly, so it's only 12 samples of latency. We can see that there is absolutely no filtering present whatsoever when there is no clipping. If there is clipping, then it will filter the signal. But when using clipping properly, you're only going to be clipping for a very short amount of time. That filtering is never audible. And this is what the delta oversampling is, is that it's oversampling the difference. So it's never applying that filter unless the signal is clipped. Then if we look at K-clip zero, I've got the latency set to 31 samples. So that's what it says here. And we can see that it is indeed linear phase. So there is no phase shift, but there is filtering always present, even though the signal is not being clipped. So not only does GM Audio Clipper version two have lower latency, but it also doesn't have any filtering unless the signal is being clipped, making it more transparent than other clippers on the market. In the article, I state that if you can find a clipper that has lower latency, better CPU efficiency at the same oversampling rate or higher, and better aliasing rejection at a lower price, then I will refund you the cost of GM Audio Clipper. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't one, and I'd be very interested if you could find one. That's what makes GM Audio Clipper the best clipper for Ableton Live.